Good morning. So you made it, and um, thank you for making it. For those who are joining us online, thank you for joining us online. If you are not from Iowa, um, we are in the middle of snowpocalypse with negative 40 wind chills. And um, it's, uh, I guess, usual for some of you guys that grew up here. Uh, for me, having only been here, I guess, working on my seventh year, it's not usual. And I'm not 100% sure how any of you could get used to it. Um, I, my snowblower went out. I was shoveling my driveway yesterday. I have never um, cursed the idea of living in Iowa until about 11 a.m. yesterday, halfway through my driveway. And I thought, why does this church have to be in a place that gets so cold? It's freezing here, but it's warm in here. Thank you for being here this morning. You've made it. Um, I was listening to the news this morning, trying to get some helpful tips on living in Iowa because um, no one gives you an instruction manual and they don't tell you things like um, go out and blow snow or shovel snow two or three times as the snow's coming down, uh, you know, to make sure that it's not as much work at the end. And, you know, just a little help, helpful t uh, tips and tricks. And so I'm watching the news and they were interviewing a fire chief of a rural area, not too far from here. And they were like, listen, what's some advice you can give some people uh, going through this terrible weather and the, you know, the snowstorm, the blizzard, whatever. And he said, well, I got two pieces of advice and so I'm ready to write something down. He said, first thing is, if you're out there shoveling snow and you feel your heart start palpitating, um, he said, stop shoveling snow. <laughs> so, oh, all right, well, I don't need to write that one down. I can figure that one's pretty obvious, right? And so he goes, I got another one. And um, I thought, well, the other one has to be better than the first one, right? Because, you know, obviously if your heart's palpitating, you ought to stop whatever it is you're doing. I'm not a doctor, but that's pretty clear. The second thing he said was, when you're out shoveling snow, if you get really cold and listening, he said, go inside. That's what he said. And so those two things weren't helpful for me, but maybe it's just the intuition you're supposed to have as a human to let you know uh, how to survive Iowa winters. We are working through Hebrews 12, one through three. And today we're gonna be talking about the sin that trips you up the sin that trips you, us, up. We have worked through this in three ways, but I wanna to talk to you for a minute about our New Year's resolutions because we're still in resolution month. And I know each of you, as we work through a different topic in Hebrews 12, one through three, are considering making resolutions that you are working through your own goals as to where you wanna be and where you are right now and setting steps to get there. And so I just wanna start you by priming the pump with um, uh, some information that I gleaned this week from a blog, from a podcast that coincides perfectly with the scripture that we're covering today. And so even though what we're gonna talk about at the very beginning didn't come straight from scripture, you'll see how well it dovetails right into scripture, which is the source for all of our truth. So I hope that you have been making resolutions. I hope discipline is becoming part of your life. I hope you wanna be disciplined in your life in at least three ways. One is spiritual, the second is emotional or relational, and the third is physical, because they all go hand in hand and a disciplined person runs the race runs the race that the author of Hebrews talks about and also the apostle Paul talks about so many times in scripture. So let's talk for just a second about some tips for evaluating your life, taking stock in last year and figuring out where you wanna go over this next year. I heard a quote this week that I thought was good. When your Saturdays begin to look like your Tuesdays, you might be becoming disciplined when you're not looking forward to the next time where we fall off the wagon, where we end up having to start over, but you become consistent and it becomes part of our life. Now, spiritually, physically, emotionally, or relationally, we have to put things in our lives so that we can grow. We have to put steps and they have to be steps that are attainable. And to know where it is that we're going, we have to know where it is we are, just like setting a GPS or telling your iPhone to get directions somewhere. It has to know where you start and then it has to know where you wanna end up and then it charts a course or a map on how to get there. Now my iPhone, if I tell it to find a destination and to give me directions, will usually offer me two or three possibilities. And it'll say, this one might take three minutes longer, but you go through town. This may be a little faster, but you get on the freeway. There are different ways to get to your destination. You have to choose how it is you're gonna chart your course to get to your goal. So I'm gonna assume that we are working through the process of knowing where we are and, and, and also praying about and thinking about where it is we wanna go. But here are some things, some ways you can evaluate your last year. This was um, a, a Mel Robbins podcast that some of this information came from, I'm not endorsing the 
podcast, just had some good information. Uh, she suggested that if you wanna be able to evaluate your last year, because I forget a lot about what happened over the last year. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember what happened two weeks ago, uh, depending on how fast life moves. And have you ever said that was last week and it was last month, or you said a couple months ago and it was six months ago, or last year and it was three years ago? The older we get, the faster life moves. It just seems like it's going crazy. She said, look at the camera roll on your phone and scroll back over the last year. And you'll see some of the events that happened during the last year. And you'll remember weddings, funerals, promotions, vacations, big moments, birthday celebrations. And as you look back over your last year, it will trigger in you a reminder as to what you've been through. And you ought to at least ask yourself a couple of questions. What were the highlights from your last year? What were the best things that happened to you last year? I'd be interested to know what were the best things that happened to you over the last year. What do you look back on and celebrate? Now, it's a personal question, but I think it primes the pump for us as we begin thinking about this. The second one may be a little closer to your mind, depending on how last year went for you. But what was the hardest thing about last year for you? What was the struggle you went through or that you're going through that started last year? Does anything come to mind? I'm not gonna ask you what it is. I just wanna know if anything comes to mind. Okay, me too. We um, learn from the hardest things in life. So what did you learn from the hard things that you went through last year? Or if they're not over, what are you learning from some of these hard things? A crisis is a crisis if it's wasted, but a crisis can become a learning opportunity if we lean into it a little bit, even though we don't like it. And we say, God, what is it I can learn? Now there's a difference. When bad things happen to you, you don't have to say, oh God, why did you do this to me? What are you trying to teach me? Because sometimes bad things just happen. But you can say, God, I am going through a difficult time. I may have caused this myself. You may have brought this to me. Don't know why it's here, but what can I learn about you and about myself as I evaluate these really, really difficult times. You're not the same person who you were a year ago. You now today in January of 2024 are very different than you were in January of 2023. You're spiritually different, physically different, and emotionally and relationally different. You've changed. Now the question is, has the change been for the better? Because a person who runs the race we've been talking about with purpose, with patience, matures and grows through the good things and the bad things. And as we run this race, we look back a year or two years or three years and we see progress. Sometimes progress is hard to see. Well, there are just a few more things I wanna share with you, a few more of these points to prime our pump. What are you gonna stop doing this year that you were doing last year? Now this gets into your resolution business, but it also ties in really well with what we're gonna be talking about in just a few minutes. So what's the one thing, if there is one thing you were doing last year that you know you need to stop doing this year, not because your mom told you or your wife told you or your husband told you, although those may be good reasons and you might should listen, but because you have decided deep down within you, you want to be different and you are going to stop doing something because a resolution or a change can't happen because someone else told you to. It has to happen because you have decided this is what God wants for you and this is how you're going to grow in these three areas, physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual. What is it? Stop drinking, stop complaining, stop gossiping, stop overspending, ruthlessly eliminate Amazon from your life, whatever it is, right? You know, I don't know. What are you gonna continue doing this year that you did last year that really worked? What are you gonna start? What do you resolve to start this year that you knew maybe should have been in your life last year and it wasn't? Celebrate the little wins, but revise your goals as you go. Are you organizing your life clutter free? Are you making your life clutter free. 
Because the author of Hebrews talks about, in light of all those who've run this race before you, the fathers of our faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David, the New Testament heroes now applicable to us where the writer of Hebrews or author of Hebrews didn't know all of them like we do. But the Apostle Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Stephen, the martyr, maybe somebody close to you, a parent, a grandparent, a friend who's had influence in your life because they've run the race, they've run the race and they've done at least two things. And I hope this jogs or triggers some thoughts for you. But the thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago, keep your eyes on the fact that they ran and they ran faithfully and they finished the race. And secondly, that they're waiting for you to finish your race so that they can celebrate and understand what it is that God has for all of us when we're together. But then last week we talked about something really important. And it's all part of decluttering your life and adding the things into your life that need to be there, but taking the things out that don't. And that was that we throw off any of the weight that hinders us. Do you remember we talked about our pasts last week and the things we've experienced, the good and the bad, the disappointments and the successes, the things that we use to define ourselves and also maybe to make excuses for ourselves. And the imagery is just so powerful here as we work through the book or chapter 12, the beginning of chapter 12 in the book of Hebrews, that we're all running a race. And the word for race, as you'll see in your notes, is, is the word that is translated to agony or marathon, not sprint. That some of our spiritual lives are spent sprinting because we're on fire for God one second and we're committed and then the next second we're tired and we're disillusioned and we sit and we rest and then we sprint again and we get tired and become disillusioned and we sit and we rest. And eventually the rest periods and the sitting periods become longer than the sprinting periods. And we look back and we look at the failures and become disillusioned. And the author of Hebrews says, listen, don't get tired of your faith. Don't get tired with your commitment. Remember your first love. And when you begin to run, run like a marathon with purpose, realizing so many people have finished well before you and throw off any of the extra weight that would keep you from running well to put the past behind you. For the Jews who were hearing this book as it was written or read to them, it would have been their legalistic past, bad religious experiences, people judging them, seeing when people became Christians, how other Jews treated them, the pressure to go back to the rules and regulations and, and all of the do's and don'ts of their faith. And the author of Hebrews says, listen, you've got to ruthlessly put the past behind you Celebrate the good, let the bad die. Put a period at the end of the sentence and start over. And the author of Hebrews continues that thought, but along the idea or with the idea of decluttering, when I go back to the, the Mel Robbins podcast, who as far as I know isn't a believer, maybe she is, she said, listen, if you're going to declutter your life, if you're going to simplify, if you're going to set your goals and you're going to know where you are and where you want to go. And by the way, the author of Hebrews, and next week you'll hear about this, says where we're going is by we set our eyes on Jesus and he is the finish line. But she says it's simple. If you've decided what you're going to start doing and what you're going to, going to stop doing, then you organize your lives accordingly. You organize your lives, you declutter your lives, you intentionally put things in your lives that are gonna help you accomplish your goals. If one of your goals is that you're gonna have dry January, great goal, then get rid of the stuff that would keep you from having dry January. If one of your goals is to read your Bible every single day, then how are you gonna make sure that you can set a goal or an attainable goal and put something in your life where you can do that? Perhaps you wanna take your Bible and put it somewhere where you go every single day. Maybe somewhere like the restroom, put it right next to the throne so that when you sit, you can read and you can accomplish or perhaps by your, by your bed, your nightstand. You organize your life, you wanna diet. What do you do? You don't say I'm gonna diet and walk past the cabinet every single day dealing with the temptation. You take the junk food and go give it to the neighbor so that it's not in your life. 
But the steps that we take to declutter are very simple and they translate to spiritual discipline, to emotional, relational discipline and physical discipline. And the author of Hebrews is saying, as we run the race, declutter, focus, set your eyes. When you've shed all the weight you need to shed, when you've dealt with the past, when you've chosen to forgive, when you haven't let regret paralyze you, but propel you, when you've been willing to let God put a period at the end of the sentence and let you start over again. The next instruction that he gives is he says, there are things that are gonna trip you up. So it's really an interesting image. The image is that as we run, like on a track, not a treadmill, that there are people there, Christians who've gone before. And they're not watching you run necessarily because there's very little to no biblical evidence that they pay attention to what's going on here in your lives on earth, but they're there, perhaps turned around away from the track watching Jesus, waiting for us to finish. And as we run, we realize that we're just carrying a little too much weight and the weight becomes makes it impossible. And the author of Hebrews suggests through context that it's the weight of your past, the weight of your identity, the weight of the things you've been through. And he says, literally take off a few layers. Like when you came into church today, when you walked in today, you probably had more on than you do right now. And you literally shed layers as you walk through the cafe or through the front doors to where now you weigh less than you did when you came in. You've shed the weight. And so after we've done that, we go to the next point, which is today. And he says, listen, as you're running, it's just like walking through the nursery. There are gonna be little things in your path, like two-year-olds. Have you ever tried to walk through a herd of two-year-olds that are gonna trip you up? Or if you've ever walked through a dark room in the middle of the night and stepped on Legos or a dog bone, that there are things there and they're lurking and sometimes subtle, but they're real. And the author compares them to sin. And he says, you gotta get rid of them or as you're running, even if you've shed the weight, you're gonna trip and you're gonna fall. And I'm not gonna say anything else about this because we're gonna sing a few songs and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about this. And I'm just gonna walk you through a very simple process of self-examination so that if there are things in your life that are lurking, that may trip you up, that may cause you to stumble in your race of life, that you can identify them, eliminate them. And today we can live a different way. So it occurred to me that I was making an assumption earlier in my first, uh, the first half of the, the message. And that assumption was that you maybe have been here over the last couple of weeks or tuned in online and that um, you knew the passage that I was talking about, you were familiar with it. And I described it or explained it, but I'd like to just read it to you again as we drill down and pull out our phrase for this morning. So I'm gonna read it, you can follow along with me. And this is the passage we've been in now for the last three weeks and will continue to be in for at least the next week and perhaps the next two to really do it justice as we start off the new year together and we start off this year right. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, remember I just talked about that? Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, remember that phrase, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now, when you read it and you read it in English and you read it quickly, it's easy to just sort of glaze over and go, yeah, 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 I'm sure that's true but I have no idea why that's important to me. And that's why we've taken, you know, four to five weeks to break this apart and really understand it because it's so powerful. And so we're talking right now this morning about the things that can get in your and my way, the sin that literally trips us up as we are running, not sprinting, running with purpose, this race that we call life. Now I'm gonna jump in ahead of myself. I wanna show you a couple pictures here in a second. 
But just to define sin for you, sin is any thought, any action or any attitude that's displeasing from God and that separates you and me from a right relationship with God and in turn, a right relationship with others. Now I view my last week through what I'm teaching on Sunday. And uh, if you ever, we hang out, I'm always talking about stuff I'm preaching on. I always ask you questions. I'm always, I got some, I wanna find insight from you. And, and so I just had my phone this week uh, with me, of course, and my camera. And I just took a few pictures this week as I went through my week and they're random. They seem to be random, but to me, they were great examples of things that could potentially trip us up, things that we don't normally think about that could trip us up. Some of the things are the things that we just do to ourselves. Now, I don't know if you know where this is, okay? Now, I'm a germaphobe. I've told you that. Now, I'm a germaphobe. I'll shake your hand. I'll give you a hug. If your hand is wet, that concerns me a little bit. Water of unknown origin. If I give you a hug, I don't really want to kiss on the cheek, but I mean, that's just, you know, normal human decency and decorum. But I mean, I'm not like germaphobe, like put myself in a bubble and, you know, stay away. I just think about it, right? I have hand sanitizer in every vehicle and I'm aware of when I have and have not sanitized my hands confession time. So I think about things and you know, people are germy. You know that, right? And this is germ season. This is like germ season. By, like, this is it. This is the time. And this is the pharmacy. This is a picture of the pharmacy at High V on Prairie Trail. Now I want to explain to you what happens at the pharmacy. And I was not in line at the pharmacy. I was waiting for my wife and I was acting like I was in line because the line moved so slow. I could just sit there and wait for her to come out and then just drive around and be fine. And it occurred to me that the high V at Prairie Trail, when you ask for your prescription from the pharmacy, you see the little window where the pharmacist is waving at you from inside, double pane glass without germs. And, and then there's the person in the car. They have an old school phone that's like a pay phone that you take with your hand and you take it off of that little pedestal and you put it on your face when you're in your car and you say, give me my prescription, please. Now, you may not think that's a big deal. I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire life because every sick person in the entire city of, of at least Southern Ankeny goes through that line and puts that thing on their face. And to me, it's the same thing as going down to Mercy Hospital, standing out in front of the ER and lip kissing every single person who comes out. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. It's like something you'd see in 1960. Now, if you've done that, you're not a germaphobe, forgive me. I'm expressing my own concerns and the way I view the world. But sometimes you just do stuff to yourself and it trips you up. Can you imagine the next day? It's like, oh, oh, I don't feel so good. You put it to your face, man. How, how dumb can you be, right? That we do to ourselves. There's other things we do. This is my week. A little dysfunctional, I'm sharing with you. Here's the next photo. This is my wife, beautiful, not happy to be uh, having me take a random picture of her at Hy-Vee. Um, didn't know why I was using it. I took it and I said, hey, I'm using this in church. And she said, oh, I hope it was a good one. Um, and it was, of course, she never takes a bad picture. Um, but this is some things other people like um, the system, the world we live in can do to us, right? Some things that they just happen, that it's like in our face all the time. Now you see my wife, she's buying an onion, a healthy onion. We have a commitment to each other. And you know, our, part of our New Year's resolution is our diet on point, right? And, and we wanna make sure that all of 2024, our diet is on point. So here we are going through high V, we're getting our lean pork and our chicken and Joy's buying an onion. And what do you see right in front of her? The whole row, the whole aisle crammed full of junk that would trip us up. And I even asked Joy, I'm like, hey, you want a Reese's? And she says, don't ask me that question because it, both of us wanted a Reese's. It wasn't about whether we wanted a Reese's, it was about whether we were gonna have a Reese's and we were minding our own business and the world shoved it in our face. And that's one of the ways that sin can trip us up. You're tracking with my week? All right, all right, we got two more pictures. It'll be quick, I promise. Here's the next, here's the next photo. Okay, this is me sitting in the doctor's office, back to the germs. I had to go for my annual physical, which is all, all kinds of fun, right? I have to go every year. And so I'm sitting in the doctor's office and I'm in the normal doctor's office, like the side where people who are well go, right? 
And, um, and I'm sitting there and I'm just sort of looking around. And do you see the color change in the carpet there in the lobby of the, the doctor's office? Do you see how it goes from a light, light cream to a dark brown? Well, this is the normal doctor's office for people who are well, who are feeling good and, you know, having a good day. And this is the urgent care side. And they think that a magic carpet color change is gonna protect from all the germs, from all the people who had to go to urgent care and couldn't even wait to see the doctor. And me, who's only sitting five feet away, who's feeling perfectly good. There's a germ theme here. I know this was my week. I'm sharing it with you. Sometimes the things or the sin that trips us up are other people who are in our lives and shouldn't be there. And we may think we have a barrier in our life that keeps us protected, but in fact, we don't. To us, we think it's real, but it's as absurd as a color change in the carpet. Sometimes other people in our lives who shouldn't be there trip us up and we know it and we keep going back. Well, the last picture is me and I'm almost ashamed to admit this. It was on Friday during Snowpalooza in the blizzard warning. And when the news comes on and they say, do not go outside, you're going to turn into dust. Nobody leave their home. That makes me want to go outside and leave my home. I just literally do just because they tell me not to. So I went outside. I left my home. I didn't wear a mask. I went to the gym on Friday and I have a friend who's right here sitting back four rows and we hold ourselves accountable each other about going to the gym. So I took a selfie in the gym parking lot. Joy was already in in the warm and I was parking the car. And I took a selfie of myself at the gym parking lot, feeling all good that I was there in the middle of a blizzard. And I sent it to Sean and I said, hey, did you work out today? Thinking that I was going to get one up on him. And he sends me back a text and he said, yeah, it's 6.30 a.m. Now, the reason that that was, um, this was 9.45 in the, in the morning, which to Sean was like, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. And I thought by comparing myself to him, that I was going to get a leg up and feel better about myself. And in reality, the tables were turned and I found out that I was slacking. Sometimes the sin that trips us up is comparing ourselves to other people. Where they are in life, where we think they are in life, whether we think we're doing better than them or whether we find out in reality they're doing better than us. And sometimes the sin that trips us up is just simply looking around way too much instead of looking up. Sin is any thought, action, or attitude that's displeasing to the Lord. And in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews calls it the sin that entangles. He says, throw off the sin in your life that so easily entangles or literally wraps around your feet like preschoolers in the nursery or Legos in the middle of the night or a dog bone on your LVP floor that you step on when you don't know that it's there. Now, when you think of sin, you may think of a lot of different things. It depends on how you grew up and it depends on your view of God. Most of the time, immediately people go to social issues and think of sins. Traditionally, the church was preoccupied with three things, right? Smoking, drinking, cussing. If you didn't smoke, you didn't drink, you didn't cuss, you were probably right with God, but you could be a gossip, you could be filled with pride, you could be a glutton, you could be a bigot, you could be all sorts of things. And you kind of got to pass. And clearly, if you have an addiction to something, whether it be alcohol or tobacco or fast food, anything that controls our life that we're addicted to is something that's tripping us up and we should deal with but I challenge you to read the New Testament, particularly read about the life of Jesus and come to any other conclusion, but that Jesus was much more scandalized by the sins of the spirit than he ever was the sins of the flesh. The sins of the flesh, the holy three or five that we grew up living in fear of, thinking that if we checked off the right boxes, we were right with God, were the things that Jesus just sort of looked around, not because he didn't care about them, but because he knew that when the heart was right, the behavior would follow. And it was the sins of the spirit that grieved him so much. The anger, the bitterness, the jealousy, the rage, the, the pride, the self-righteousness 
the stuff that separates us from God and separates us from each other. And so as we drill down and we realize the things in our life that trip us up, they're real things. But a lot of times they're thoughts. A lot of times they're actions and attitudes. Now, sin in general is something that we have, if we are Christians, been forgiven for. So the sin that put Jesus on the cross, the sin that would send us to hell, our sinful condition, if we have confessed our sin and believed in Jesus and asked him to be our Lord and Savior, then we are forgiven for those sins. And that's behind us. It's permanent. It's gone. We can't lose our salvation. That sin is forgiven. But there's a relational sin that goes on. There's a sin in a relationship between a father and a son or a daughter, Jesus, God, our father and, and us. And when we behave in such a way that quenches the Holy Spirit in us, that, that turns our heart away from who we're supposed to be and who he is, that separates us from him and others, our relationship isn't right with him. And even though it never sends us back to hell, it still suspends our usefulness, our, our joy of life, our rightness. And so when the author of Hebrews says, you got to get rid of the sin that trips you up, he's not talking about the sin you were born with and the sin that God dealt with through Jesus on the cross, the sin that most of us have asked forgiveness for when we received him as our personal Lord and Savior. He's talking about the stuff that gets in the way of this. If you're married, you know that if there's something between you and your husband or your wife, chippiness, something that you've done, that she's done, that he's done, that causes a tension in your relationship. You very well still may be married, but it doesn't mean things are okay. And a decent person acknowledges what they've done and apologizes and makes it right so that the relationship can, can continue. Do you follow me? Are you tracking with me? So this is the reason we wanna get rid of these things in our life. I want you to think beyond the sins of the flesh unless you're struggling with an addiction and they clearly we have to deal with those things because you can't even deal with the sins of the spirit until we deal with those things that are, that are putting us in danger. But I want you to focus right now on those things that are right in here that nobody else sees. And I want you to ask yourself some hard questions. And I have three different, well, three different ways to think about it. Three words, two different sets of three. So I guess they're six. The first one are P's, if you like that, as you examine your own life. And I'm gonna read those to you, but then I'm gonna talk, take a little pause here and talk about the way I like to define it. The first set of three are when you would look at your life and say, is there anything in my life that is tripping me up? I would ask you about your priorities, right? That's the first thing, that's obvious. What are my priorities? Where do I spend my time? What do I think about? And where do I spend my money? Those are your priorities, friend. You wanna know what's important to you? Those are the three ways that tell you what's important to you. And there's no arguing about it. So priority is the first one. Practices, what do I do? And procrastinations, what don't I do? And what should I start doing? Now, I like that, that three, uh, little series of three there, but that's really not where I want us to end because the next set of three is what I've used for so many years in ministry. It parallels or coincides with this first one, but I give you both in case you think about your own life better in this first way than the second way. Thoughts, actions, attitudes are what I've always used to evaluate myself. And when I evaluate myself, I wanna look at the sins of the spirit. I'll just share some personal examples with you here. In case you're feeling good about yourself, I wanna share with you how maybe you shouldn't, well, at least I shouldn't feel good about myself because as I examine the things that I think God cares about with my spirit or in my spirit, I found that there's some things that are tripping me up. Let me share some of these with you. It's my own list. You can make your list if you want to, or I'll give you a copy of mine if you want. Matthew 22 says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not 95%, but 100%. Yeah, sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. Now, I'm not comparing myself to you. I may be a better Christian than you. I may not be a better Christian than you, whatever that means. I don't know, right? It doesn't matter. When I say I'm not good at this stuff, I'm comparing myself to Jesus. And when we compare ourselves to Jesus and you're my teammate, not my adversary or somebody I'm competing with, we're helping each other be like Jesus. I compare myself to Jesus. My goodness, I don't measure up real well. My heart is toward God. I, I would love it to be 100%. I didn't give myself an A+. Plus. Here's the next one. Matthew 22, 39 tells me to love my neighbor as I love myself. Be as eager for things to go well for my neighbor as I am eager for things to go well with me. And in some cases with certain people in my life, yes, sir. When something good happens to Dan, it's like something good happens to me, I celebrate it. But there are some people in my life 
who, if I tell you the truth in my dark moments, when something bad happens to them, I think they're getting what's coming to them. And then I find myself falling into a sinful loop that on the other side leads me to believe where they're not getting what's coming to them or I don't want them to because then I have to get what's coming to me and I certainly don't want that. I don't even pass this number two, the second test. Do all things without grumbling. Philippians 2, no grumbling, inside or outside. Couldn't even shovel snow without cursing the whole state of Iowa yesterday. Got a D. First Peter 5, cast all your anxieties on him so I'm not being weighed down by them anymore. <sighs> Only say things that give grace to others, especially those who are closest to me. Ephesians 4. And Ephesians 5 goes on and says, make good use of your time. Don't waste it. Don't blow it. Invest it. So when I look at the things in my life that can trip me up, I get some thoughts and I get some attitudes right off the bat. They just aren't right. And sometimes we come by them naturally and sometimes, right? Somebody else puts it in our face. Sometimes these things are caused by the people we choose to spend our closest time around and they really shouldn't be in our life. And sometimes they're caused because we look around a little too much and we compare ourselves to others, which makes us legalistic and judgmental and proud. So I wanna ask you, if you will examine your life and we're almost done, I can't do this for you. But are there any thoughts that trip you up as you run this race of life? Do you have any attitudes toward a person, toward a group of people that would indicate you live in a way that may be inconsistent with the way Jesus would live? And I understand that we live in an irritating and annoying time with opinions and groups being shoved in your face and ideologies being trafficked, but we still have to have the same mindset as Jesus and cannot let our attitudes be affected. We have to separate the ideas from the individuals and we truly have to love people like Jesus did. And I have some attitudes that set themselves up against me being like Jesus and walking with God. Do you have any actions in your life that divide you from the people closest to you and separate you from God your Father? Any expressions, any behavior patterns, anything that as you run sneaks up and knocks you down. So the author of Hebrews, as he works carefully through this Hebrews 12, one, two, and three, is building a case. And you've got to come next week because next week we're talking about on whom, whom we focus when we run. But so far, we've talked about the cloud of witnesses that have run before us. We've talked about the past that can pull us back and weigh us down. And today we've talked about the thoughts, the actions, the attitudes that can come because the world puts them in our face, because the wrong people are in our life, because we choose these things or because we compare ourselves to other people. Thoughts, actions, and attitudes that as we're trying to run with consistency and with purpose, with patience, literally trip us and make us fall. Because I don't know about you, but I know that me, 2024, I want it to be better than it was last year. I want to be different at the end of the year. I want to be more consistent. I don't want to trip. I don't want to stumble. I don't want to fall. And when I get to the end of the year, I want to see each of you with me, each of us together, hand in hand, finishing the year together, different spiritually, relationally and emotionally and physically different than we were this year because it makes a difference. And that's the way we run the race. So I want to pray for you and you got to come back because we're not done. If you couldn't be here today, 
Come next week. No snow. Pastor Dan promises no snow next week. I haven't looked at the 10-day forecast. Back together next week. If you only join us online, join us online because this is only starting to get fun. Father, thank you so much for the time that we've spent together. And I pray that you would continue to speak to us and speak through us to a world that desperately needs to, to hear you. And it's just particularly important in a time like we are in right now, a political season with a caucus right around the corner and ideas and people separating us from the world around us, dividing families and friend groups where we can become so dangerously opinionated that we carelessly shift focus from the uniting power of the cross of Jesus Christ to the dividing tendency to fight for our own agenda. And I pray, Father, that we would stand with truth, but also in love and gentleness for the things that are biblical, but that we would stand with the people in our world, whether we agree with them or whether we don't, because Jesus died for them just like he died for us. And our goal here is to unite people at the foot of the cross. So I pray for my church, for our family, your church, that our thoughts, that our actions, that our attitudes would be pleasing to you and that we would run this race in a way where nothing would trip us up. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.